The Elemental Plains are home to some of the most beautiful and terrifying sights one can behold. And every once in a while, they give rise to something not even the primal lords expected. Hello and welcome to Monster of the Week, the show where we dig up old creations lost to both time and the number of pages you can fit into a source book. This is kind of a special episode in the fact that we're actually following up on a comment that was left by a member of the community here. A few weeks back, I released my video on para-elementals, which, in case you didn't catch that one, para-elementals are elementals that are a combination of two different kinds of energy. For example, from fire and air you get smoke elementals, or from water and earth you get ooze elementals. They're really cool, and we had a lot of great conversation in the comments on that video about how we would use them, and where we would put them in our games, and that kind of thing. One comment though, left by GamerGeek, asked a really interesting question. What would happen if you combined more than two types of elemental energy? I thought that was a really interesting question, and something I hadn't even considered myself while I was making that video. A few of you weighed in on the subject, and we had some good conversation about it, it was really cool. I didn't think this idea had been explored in any of the official source books, however, in 4th edition, also known as the edition with a million variants of every type of monster, there actually are a bunch of elementals I didn't even know existed. There are actually a ton of them, and I think some of them are really cool and really interesting, so today we're going to be talking about a few of those elementals that follow our idea of combining three types of elemental energy into one creature. All of these monsters though, not just the ones I'm talking about in this video, can be found in the Monster Manual 2 from 4th edition. So if you're interested in checking out more elemental variations aside from what we're talking about in today's video, definitely take a look. Now the three elementals we'll be talking about today are the Chillfire Destroyer, the Flame Spiker, and the Stormstone Fury. I think each of these monsters has something unique to add to pretty much any game, and I'm really excited to show you what they can do. So, to start things off, let's talk about the Chillfire Destroyer. This creature is a combination of elemental air, water, and fire. They are described as a raging inferno held in check by a shell of hard ice. The Destroyer stands over 10 feet tall and carries itself in a very intimidating manner. Like basically every elemental, whoever elemental, the Chillfire Destroyer has a slam attack. Because its body is encased in some of the coldest ice imaginable, it does not only bludgeoning damage, but cold damage as well. It also has excellent control over its mutable form and can move through an opponent's square if it wishes, causing them to be knocked prone if they fail a save. Up until this point, it's pretty standard stuff. Most elementals are basically just brutes that have a couple neat combat tricks. However, the Chillfire Destroyer has one very unique trait. As the Destroyer takes more and more damage, its icy shell begins to crack. With each strike, the raging flame imprisoned within the creature starts to leak out. Once the creature's lost half its hit points, this becomes a real problem for the players. Up until until this point, they might think that you describing the fire leaking from its body was just some good interesting narration by the DM. However, when it drops below that halfway point, any creature that moves into or starts its turn within 10 feet of the Chillfire Destroyer is going to take damage. The flames start to get so out of control, they're just burning up everything around the creature. Now this should tip off your players about the creature's final ability, the Fire Core Breach. When the Chillfire Destroyer's health reaches a total of zero or less, it doesn't die right away. In fact, it actually survives until the start of its next turn. Between the time when it's at zero hit points and the start of its next turn, it can't actually take any actions. It's basically just melting down. When it's turning the initiative order rolls around, no longer restrained by its icy shell, it lets loose a massive burst of energy that causes critical damage to everything within 20 feet. Hopefully your players clue in by then to what's going on, but if not, simply felling this creature isn't necessarily going to be enough to survive the encounter. That said though, if you're running an encounter with more than one of these things, after the players learn what happens when one of them dies, they might be able to actually use that to their advantage in combat if they're clever enough. I think this combination of abilities is just excellent game design. The flavor of the monster is somewhat exotic, enough to make your players ask questions about not only its origin, but what is its role amongst all of the other elementals. And it basically telegraphs this big final explosion, so if your players do get incinerated, they should feel like it's on them. The only other thing I would consider adding to this monster isn't necessarily an ability, but more so an adjustment to its speed. The Chillfire Destroyer is meant to be a tanky monster, it wants to get into the center of combat and be there until it ultimately explodes into a burst of brilliant energy. The source book has its initial speed set to 25 feet, which I think is perfect and totally makes sense for this kind of monster. But wouldn't it be cool if the more damage it took and the more of that icy shell was removed, the faster the creature actually got. 
you could rule it so that maybe every 15 damage it takes, its move speed goes up by 5. That way, what started out as this hulking brute is now zipping around the battlefield, barely contained by its icy shell. Whether you decide to add that final ability into the monster's stat block or not, I still think it's a great monster and I'm really excited to run it against my players. Next on our list is the Flame Spiker. Formed from elemental air, earth, and fire, it serves as a frontline combat unit to more powerful elementals. They stand about the size of a human, if not a bit stockier, and possess abilities that provide a good mixture between support and direct melee combat. This creature is somewhat similar to the Chillfire Destroyer in that its body is a shell, except its shell is made up of hardened earth, which contains a fire raging within. These flames inside of its body are then stoked by the elemental air trapped in there as well. One thing about the Flame Spiker is it does rely on a lot of the combat rules from 4th edition in order to be an effective unit. I've done my best to adapt these abilities to 5th edition, so please let me know what you think because I'm still kind of working out the way I convert monsters from 4th to 5th. Anyways, our first ability, and the one I can only assume the Flame Spiker gets its name from, is called Stone Spike. The creature will attempt to strike its target with its long, lance-like appendage. On a successful strike, it deals not only piercing damage, but fire damage as the target is covered with slag. The target of this attack also has to make a save or else they become vulnerable to fire damage until the start of the Flame Spiker's next turn. This ability is great for when you have mixed encounters where you've got some Flame Spikers up front dealing some small amounts of damage but making their enemies vulnerable, and then some larger fire elementals in the back ready to reach over and strike at the now vulnerable foes. Mechanically, the vulnerability to fire makes these guys really interesting for an encounter. But logically, it can be a little hard to explain how getting attacked by one of these things would make you vulnerable to fire damage. The way I would describe it is that the slag coming off of this thing's body is now on the player's armor and clothes or whatever they happen to be wearing. Meaning that when something attacks it with fire, it heats up the slag even more causing intense burning and kind of melts away at parts of their armor. Ultimately, you can pretty much rationalize it however you want. Your players may not even question it, but that's just kind of what my thoughts on that were. Now, the second part of this attack, because there's always got to be a second part, imposes a condition that doesn't actually exist in 5th edition. When a target is hit with this attack, it becomes marked. Back in 4th edition, if you were marked by a creature, it basically meant you got negative 2 on your attack against any creature besides the one that marked you. I think the easiest way to convert this to 5th edition is to simply rule that if the target fails its save, it also has disadvantage on any other creature that it tries to attack, aside from the Flame Spiker. The whole point of this ability is that these guys are frontline soldiers and they want you to attack them. They don't want you to go after the artillery behind them that's doing the actual damage. They want to put up a wall and force you to get through them in order to get to their allies behind them. Our next ability is called Spike Bolt. This is never going to be the Flame Spiker's first choice, but against a distant target or a target on the run, it can close the gap in a pinch. Basically what this attack is, is the Flame Spiker holds up one of its arms and fires its lance-like appendage like a missile at the creature. The range on this attack isn't terribly far, it can only hit a creature up to 50 feet away, but it's always good to have some kind of ranged attack. The last ability the Flame Spiker has, again, relies pretty heavily on the 4th edition combat rules. Basically, whenever a creature shifts through one of the squares that they threaten, which was a mechanic from 4th edition that allowed you to move a couple squares on your turn without imposing attacks of opportunity, they get to make an attack of opportunity. I figured the easiest way to convert this over to 5th edition was to give them an ability that acted like a variation on the sentinel feat from the player's handbook. In my conversion, this means that anytime a creature tries to disengage from the Flame Spiker, it still gets an attack of opportunity, and if it connects with that attack of opportunity, the disengaging creature's speed is reduced to zero until the next round. I think that's fair because these creatures are extremely practiced in the art of battle, and anyone who wants to take a group of them down is going to have to use strategy and teamwork to do so. Now the third and final elemental we're going to talk about is called the Stormstone Fury. It actually shares the same elemental makeup of the Flame Spiker, meaning that it's a creature of elemental air, earth, and fire. However, this creature manifests those elements in a totally different way. The Stormstone Fury stands as a giant on the battlefield. It appears as a massive being of rock with visible ripples of energy all around it. The Stormstone Fury is of course capable of crushing opponents who find themselves unfortunately close to its form, however it functions best at a distance. 
From up to 100 feet away, the Fury can produce a Thunderstone from its own body and hurl it at a creature, causing a decent amount of damage. These Thunderstones are so volatile, however, that even if the attack misses, just by being near to it, the creature still has to make a deck save to avoid taking half damage. On a successful save, though, the creature manages to dodge the attack entirely. This, however, is not where the attack ends. The thrown Thunderstone lays on the ground, rippling with energy. At the start of the Stormstone Fury's next turn, the Thunderstone it threw last turn explodes, causing massive damage to anything within 10 feet of the place it attacked. This will probably catch some of your players off guard at first, but in the end, it will make the encounter much more exciting. If the players are clever, they might even be able to use their opponent's artillery against the frontline creatures that are up fighting them in melee. The book actually specifies that Stormstone Furies don't really show much regard for their fellow combatants, so it's not unreasonable for it to just chuck rocks at the enemy and kind of hope for the best. That said though, the book also does specify they're most likely to align themselves with creatures who have thunder immunity or resistance, so that way it doesn't have to worry about where it's throwing its thunderstones. No matter what, it's not going to hurt its allies. That may not always be the case, however, but just something to keep in mind when you're constructing the encounter. Now, as much as the Fury wants to sit at the back lines and bombard its opponents with exploding rocks, it doesn't always have the option to do so. In this event, it has two choices at its disposal. The first is a recharge ability called Shrapnel Burst. The Fury lets loose a blast from its core, causing small shrapnel and a wall of force to go against any creatures within 10 feet of it. Any target caught in the blast is going to take thunder damage, and if they fail their save, they're also going to get knocked back 10 feet, thus creating a possible opening for the hulking creature to escape. The second choice it has is an ability called Meld to Ground. Now this ability is going to be used almost exclusively for retreat, or at the very least repositioning. Once per day, the Stormstone Fury can meld its form into the ground it stands on, provided that it's some sort of natural earth, stone, or metal. In doing so, it effectively disappears, and then at the start of its next turn, it can reform anywhere up to 50 feet away from its original position. Now like I said, this can obviously be used as an option for escape, but it's also very useful to be able to change position mid-battle depending on how the battlefield changes. Or if it was feeling particularly aggressive, it could be used to chase down a fleeing creature. That extra 50 feet of movement and the ridiculous range of its thunderstone attack is a pretty good way to stop any creature in its tracks. Like I said though, this ability is only usable once per day, so it's very likely that the creature is going to want to save it for a last ditch escape effort if things turn bad. As you can see, when you start combining multiple elements together, the results can be quite powerful, but also very widely depending on how much of each element is added in versus the others. Something that seems to be kind of an overarching theme for these rare beings is that they're all sought after for their abilities, usually by other elementals. Since they incorporate so many potentially different types of elemental energy, it makes sense that other elementals would want to capitalize on that. For example, the Flame Spiker's ability to make enemies vulnerable to fire would be extremely useful to a group of fire elementals. Or the Chill Fire Destroyer could add a huge punch to a water elemental assault. As for the Stormstone Fury, I can't imagine any group preparing for battle that wouldn't want one of these things in their back line, just dropping pure shock and awe on their enemies. They're basically living artillery batteries. All that brings into question though, in your world, who exactly is it that's pining for the service of these hybrid specialists? If you're running a game where the elemental lords are at odds with one another or some other outside threat, you can guarantee they're going to want to enlist the service of these guys. On the other hand, if your game is relatively grounded in the material plane, I could totally see some powerful spellcaster trying to summon these creatures, or even trying to create them by combining the energies of monotyped elementals. This is similar to what I discussed at the end of the para-elemental video, but given how powerful these guys are, it holds true even more so, I think. Another thing that's very unique to these elementals specifically is that they have no homeland to actually call their own. I mean, even the para-elementals have those smaller planes that are trapped between the two bigger planes, right? So any instance where three elemental energies overlap in such specific amounts to create one of these creatures has got to be really rare. So any tri-elementals that don't get enlisted or end up serving some kind of master are bound to end up just kind of wandering through the planes. An elemental of this caliber may have no cause for getting involved with the affairs of the material world, 
But if some ruler were to say, offer them a space in their kingdom in exchange for their services in combat, I could see how these elementals might be motivated to then migrate to the material plane and fight on behalf of such a king. Following that same train of thought though, maybe since they don't really have a home, they're coming to the material plane to try to stake their claim here. That would kind of make sense since the material plane is a place where all the elemental energies are constantly overlapping and in conjunction with one another. This does present you with an opportunity to maybe create an area in your world that is dominated by the tri-elementals. Maybe they've even set up a small kingdom there. Or it could just give you an excuse to have them exist as a blight upon an existing kingdom. They're just coming in trying to take over. No matter what you decide to do with them though, I think the key to using these creatures effectively is putting them in positions where they can work together with other creatures. Each one of these elementals is built to be part of a team, most often a team made up of other elementals. These guys have the capacity to turn an encounter that your players think is just going to be a run-of-the-mill slugfest into a genuine fight for survival and cunning. And that, to me anyways, is where their true value actually lies. Anyways, I really enjoyed researching this monster concept and I was really happy with what I discovered. If you enjoyed watching it, please leave a comment and let me know how you plan on using them. I do have a new video every single week, so if you enjoyed what I do here and you want to see more creatures from editions past, please subscribe. And as always, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next week.